Okay, your hook for today. Is more work done when you climb the stairs or when you ride up in the elevator? Give it an answer. Change it if, if you uh, change your mind. And of course, to answer this, we need a sense of work. What is work? And here is the definition given in your textbook. It is not a definition I like very much. And ultimately, on the test, if I ask you for the definition of work, you will not give me this answer. And I'll point out the flaws in this answer in just a few slides. But for the time being, let's go with it. Most calculations are going to be done with this idea. And it is true that if you take the force that is acting and multiply it by the distance through which the force acts, you do get the amount of work done. The problem is that there are instances where work is done, but there is no clearly identifiable force or distance. So it's not a general enough definition. It is correct, it's just not a definition. So here is the exercise. I have a box and I have two people who are pushing this box across the table with their forces as indicated by the um, green and, and, and uh, blue arrows. That's the color. And the question is, what about the work that these two people are doing as they push the box across the table? And I hope it is intuitively obvious to you that this person, the person pushing down, is not helping out very much. They are exerting a force, and there is a distance through which that force acts. But I don't think this person is doing work on the box. This person, I would give credit for doing the work to move that box through the distance. And if this person here complains, say, OK, let's see you do it without this person's help. And it's clear that with just the green push, the box would not go through any distance. And thus, we learn that it matters not just the force and the distance, but the relative direction of those two. That when we multiply the force times the distance, we need to recognize that they are vector quantities. And it is only the component of the force that is parallel to the distance moved that does work. This component doesn't do any work. That we say that work is not just the product of force and distance, but because these two things are vectors, we need to decide whether that product of these two vectors is going to yield a scalar or a vector. And in this case, work is a scalar. It does not have direction. So we do the scalar product. It is tradition to use a dot to represent multiplication when you're doing a scalar product. So it is also called the dot product of force and distance is equal to work. And what we mean by the dot product is only the parallel components get multiplied together. Vector dot vector always means magnitude of vector times magnitude of vector, <coughs> excuse me, times the cosine of the angle between. You put the vectors tail to tail, there is the angle between them, and of course, the cosine of this angle gets you the parallel component. That's why this works. Tu be memorized. Okay, so let's apply it. I've got a 20 kilogram sled. I'm pulling it eight meters forward. There's a distance. But the rope makes an angle of 37 degrees with a horizontal. Looks just like the previous picture. If the force on the rope is 10 newtons, how much work is done in pulling the sled eight meters forwards? And you put an answer on your worksheet. Next problem. If a four Newton box, ooh, 20 kilogram sled, what have they told you about the sled? It's mass. Four Newton box, what have they told you about the box? 
its weight is carried 10 meters across the room so that it moves at this speed at one and a half meters above the floor, how much work? So there's the distance, 10 meters. Be very careful about this one. A free body might not be a bad idea. A free body to which you add the vector for the distance moved. And we go on. From the discussion of work to the discussion of energy. And when you were in middle school, they may have defined energy as the ability to do work, which then begs the question, what is work? That thing which energy provides you the ability to do. And I have just made the point that that I think that the definition of force times distance just will not work. I would point out that when a potato is baked or when a light bulb gives off light or many other instances, work is done on the potato. Work is done by the light bulb. But I would defy you to identify the force and the distance through which it acted. This is what I would like us to work with as the definition of work. This is what you will parrot back to me or regurgitate, if you're feeling gross, on the test. Work is the transformation of energy. Oh, my! But then, if we use for energy the ability to do work, we've got circularity here. That work is defined in terms of energy, and energy is defined in terms of work. I would like to propose that energy is a primitive notion that I cannot define in terms of other less primitive uh, notions or more primitive notions um, that, that energy is just energy. It's that thing that cars have because they're going fast. It's that thing that rocks have because they're up in the air. It's that thing that rubber bands have because you have stretched them. You know what I mean. I don't have to define it. Light has energy. Oh, oh okay. I'm starting to get a sense of it, yes, but I haven't defined it for you, and I'm not going to. But then work is defined in terms of energy. The transformation of energy, that is the moving between different forms of energy, which then suggests that there are several different forms of energy, and I was just talking about them. Here is a list of energies. It would have been fun if we weren't doing an electronic lecture for you to generate this for me. But energy is defined into two parts. <clears throat> there is kinetic energy, that is happening energy. And in addition to motion, there is heat, which is another motion at the molecular level, and sound, which is also motion uh, of, of air molecules. Um, or they could be moving through some other medium, but motion of that medium, the sound's going through. And potential. Potential means it's not happening, at least not yet. When, when I tell your parents that I see great potential in you, that means I'm not seeing anything. I believe it's there, but I'm not seeing anything. So that's what's true with energy. You got a rock up high in the air, it has gravitational potential energy and and uh, um, but it's not doing anything it's just being high in the air but if you push it off the cliff then that gravitational energy will transform into kinetic energy and that transformation is work um, electrical energy there is energy because things have charge and their relative positions um, chemical energy is a form of electrical energy. Elastic energy, the kind of energy that a rubber band has, is a form of electrical energy. It has to do with molecular bonding, just like chemical energy did. Light is a form of electrical energy. And then nuclear is another, I think we speak of it as a potential energy. You might notice that this list is very similar to the list you had for fundamental forces. 
And that makes sense. If you took a fundamental force and had it act through a distance, there ought to be an energy associated with it. And here they are. So I would like to take that idea and have you fill in this sheet that here is an agent, a light bulb, and light energy is coming out of it. What kind of energy do you put into a light bulb? And I'll give it away to you. You put in electrical energy. So electrical would go, each of these underlines, I think if I've done it right, should have an energy on it. Now, the question is, where did that electrical energy come from? And if, if you are uh, in Virginia, it came from a generator. You could say it came out of the wall, but that would be a smart alecky thing to say. How does it get there into the wall? Well, we have a generator, which is an option that, this is an agent, again, that transforms kinetic energy into electrical energy that a generator is caused to turn kinetic energy and out of it comes electrical energy. Now where did that kinetic energy come from? And, and uh, if you are out west, yeah, you don't have to be in Virginia. Anywhere you get it from a generator. If you are out west, then we could use falling water. We could do it in Virginia, but it's just not as effective, but out on in the Rocky Mountains, they do a lot of falling water, and, and in Tennessee, a lot of falling water energy, which is what kind of energy becoming kinetic energy? You can do it. But where did this energy come from? Well, I'm probably giving things away, but that, but that stuff got up in the air so that you could have this kind of energy a process called evaporation and where did the there's the mechanism that transforms some kind of energy into this you could say it's heat radiant energy um, that it's sunlight from the sun gets that water up into the air and ultimately 90 oh it's large like 99 percent of the energy that we have here on earth comes from the sun and nuclear processes in the sun which we won't try to get into but there you got energy there is another route here to the generator and this one then would be what we do in Virginia and we have a, a, a boiler and you have coal or oil or nuclear producing heat and it causes water to boil and when the water boils it gets high pressure and then we have a little hole in the side of the boiler and a jet of steam comes out there's your kinetic energy so what kind of energy is turned into kinetic energy in a boiler where did that energy come from well we used an agent called fire to turn this kind of energy into whatever kind of energy you put on that line. And finally, where did this get its energy from? And again, it got it from the sun through a agent called photosynthesis that transforms this kind of energy into this kind of energy. So would you please make sure that all of these blanks have lines on them there on your worksheet. Um, switching gears here a little bit, here is a graph of force versus position. Oh, wait a minute. Work is force times distance. The product of the values on this axis times the values on this axis represents what? If you multiply vertical by horizontal, what do you get? And, and um, you are to compare these two and that understanding of where work is found in these graphs to tell me which one of these represents more work being done and then I would like you to explain why as well. Next problem. How much work is done by this 
variable force, but it's a much better behaved variable force than those. Be very careful. I'm not asking for the total work up to the second meter. I'm asking between the first and the second meter how much work was done by this force. You put that answer on your worksheet. Throwing more stuff at you. Um, this behavior here is the behavior of an elastic medium. An elastic media, that would be singular, wouldn't it? You have, to be elastic is for the force to be proportional to the deformation. This distance here is how far the spring or rubber band is deformed. This, if you go from a proportionality to an equation, you add in a constant of proportionality, which we will leave as a k, and you have this. We have the negative here because this is the deforming force. No, this is the restoring force, but this is the deformation. So if you take a spring and you stretch it outward, the force, the restoring force of the spring is going back inward, trying to restore it, while the deformation was outward. And that's why that negative is there. If you take a spring and squish it, then the deformation is inward, but the restoring force would push back outward, hence against the negative. This is known as Hooke's Law, and I would like you to memorize it. This K here is called the elastic constant, or the spring constant. You're going to need to remember that too. And what about the area under this curve, which would be your answers up here? The area is the work, and the work being done on the spring would be one-half the base times the height. That the base being some x, the height being kx. Let me write that for you. If this is x, the deformation, then this here is kx because f is equal to minus kx, but I'm ignoring the minus because I find it inconvenient. And so the area here would be one-half the base times the height, and you get one-half kx squared. There is your first formula for a potential energy. The letter u is used for uh, potential energy. So this is elastic potential energy. One-half the spring constant times the deformation squared. Next, I would like to give you a formula for gravitational uh, potential energy. That the, uh, what we need to do is think about the amount of energy transformed when I lift something into the air. That as I lift something up, energy is leaving my body and going into the object that I'm picking up into the air. So how much work do I do? Well, what force do I have to apply? I have to apply a force equal to the object's weight. And through what distance? The distance equal to the height that I lift it to. And those two, the force, mg, and the height, h, will be parallel to one another so I can dispense with the dot that, that these, when you do a cos theta, it's going to be cosine 0 degrees and cosine of 0 is 1. This, then, is the formula for now for the rest of this year, but not into AP physics, that we will use for gravitational potential energy. Memorize it. Let us consider a, a table and a ball that I am holding up above the table. So the ball has gravitational potential energy because it has been separated from the Earth. And then I drop the ball and work is done as gravitational potential energy turns into kinetic energy. And then it hits the table and, and it gives off sound and it gets hot. And so there you have the finally um, the, all of the gravitational potential is gone and, and all of the energy has now become heat and sound. That, that the ball has no gravitational potential. But if I were to jiggle the table, 
and the ball rolled off, uh-oh, it would fall again. Where is that kinetic energy coming from if it had no potential energy when it was here on the table? Well, that wasn't quite right, Mr. Houghton. We should have said that it was still above the floor. Okay, so boom, it hits the floor. More of the energy turns into heat and sound. Now the ball has no gravitational potential energy. Uh, well, actually, we could dig a hole in the floor and the ball could fall down the hole. So it still has gravitational potential. Where would the ball have no gravitational potential? And people say, well, at the center of the Earth. But from the center of the Earth, you could still fall into the sun. And you can still fall into the center of the galaxy, even when you're in the sun. The point being made here is that this h value is always going to be relative to some place you have chosen to call zero. If you're doing an experiment that all takes place above the table, then causing the tabletop zero and looking at how high you are above the tabletop is a very effective way of talking about the gravitational potential energy. But it's only relative to the tabletop. If there's the possibility of falling to the floor, then maybe you ought to measure heights from the floor. But always there is a choice of where you measure the height from. You need to be conscious of the choice you have made. Okay, that will be important in the problems that come up. Want to go on to your third formula, and this is kinetic energy. And I'm going to start with this formula for work done by a force acting through a distance, but I want to consider where the work, the energy being transformed, is being transformed into energy of motion, which we call kinetic energy. Of course, the force will cause an acceleration, a change in velocity, and there is where the transformation to kinetic energy occurs. Um, I hope you are comfortable with the fact, oh, and the bar is gone, that I could take the formula V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2A delta X, and I'm going to take that formula and do a little algebra and substitute that value for A. So here we are, and now I can uh, distribute that 2, pull it out, and, and uh, I have one half m, and the the d's of course go here. I have one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared, and those two quantities represent the final kinetic energy and the initial kinetic energy that whatever velocity you had at the beginning represented the kind of kinetic energy you had there and what velocity you have at the end, the kind of kinetic energy at the end. This is the amount of energy that was transformed, changed into kinetic energy, being equal to the work that was done. And this then is going to be our formula for kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. Memorize that. And I have no problems for you to apply it to, and we're done with the lecture.